Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. And also, welcome back to my brand new NetData course. In this course, what I'm doing is teaching you everything that you'll need to know in order to use NetData as your monitoring solution of choice. In this particular episode, what we're going to do is dive into the concept of troubleshooting. And this is a way of life for us as system administrators. The truth is, things do go wrong. It's just the way it is. But when that happens, it's important that we stay calm and figure out what's going on. And that's what troubleshooting is. It's all about getting to the root cause of whatever a situation happens to be. So in this video, what we're going to do is dive into troubleshooting concepts around net data, and let's get started right now. To begin this lesson, let's revisit the concept of anomalies. An anomaly is something that's out of place and is often something we'll need to dive into. Other times, an anomaly is expected, such as CPU spikes when our systems install updates. That represents an anomaly, but not necessarily a bad one. If we install a bunch of patches, we can reasonably expect CPU and memory to spike, as well as storage to be utilized while we install things. Most often, though, an anomaly represents a concern area, especially if something like CPU or RAM is spiking and it's not expected, such as a stuck CPU process. And you know what? It happens. It's a part of life. But regardless, anomalies are definitely something we should pay attention to. One of the ways that NetData can assist us with this is the Anomaly Advisor. And this is accessible within its own dedicated tab. And here it is. And depending on where you access this, you'll see different information. For example, if you access it from an individual node, you'll see anomaly information specific to that node. On the other hand, if you access this tab through NetData Cloud, you'll see relevant information across your entire infrastructure. The way this is displayed is you'll have what's called an anomaly rate, which refers to the percentage of metrics that are anomalous. You can see that my anomaly rate is quite low, but if you're dealing with actual issues within your infrastructure, yours will be much higher. Like I mentioned before, anomalies aren't always bad. It depends on context. One example of this is a server where the CPU is generally 20% utilized. That's definitely not a concern at all, but if the usage spikes to 30% briefly, that's considered an anomaly since it's 10% more than usual. However, 30% CPU usage isn't going to be a problem unless it reaches a much higher threshold. Still, any metric that falls outside of this normal baseline represents an anomaly, and as the administrator, you'll decide for yourself which anomalies are worth your time and attention. It's a good idea that we understand how anomalies are detected. The way this works is by machine learning. In general, machine learning is a concept that makes it easy to detect patterns within data, and patterns are definitely an important aspect of detecting anomalies. Within NetData, there are some important design principles at play here. The first of these is that machine learning models should be unsupervised. This means that anything these models can do without bothering you, they should do by themselves. This is a key design principle even outside of anomaly detection, because for the most part, you don't really have to configure anything within NetData. The idea is that the less time you spend configuring alerts and tuning things, the better. That means you can spend less time tweaking things and more time getting your actual job done. Another key design principle within anomaly detection is that whenever possible, machine learning should be in real time. It's important that the data we're seeing is always up to date, otherwise it'll just slow us down. We really do need to see up to the minute or even up to the second information when we view our charts and metrics, otherwise the information just won't be as useful. This also means that some CPU utilization is expected in order to provide real-time information, but NetData always keeps its resource footprint as low as possible, so that way it doesn't itself cause anomalies. The next design principle is that everything should be integrated. This means that with NetData, machine learning is tightly integrated into the design, so that way it's not an afterthought, it's an important aspect of the entire stack. This also means that having machine learning integrated will tie everything into the troubleshooting practices that we're most used to. Finally, assist, advice, and consult has to do with the realization that no matter how good a machine learning model happens to be, there could sometimes be a situation where the model isn't 100% correct, and the reason this realization is important is because nobody wants to be woken up in the middle of the night over a false positive. For this reason, NetData focuses on assisting and consulting with assisted men rather than wasting their time. The idea is to empower administrators, not to hinder or annoy them. 
Now that we know more about the machine learning that NetData utilizes in the background, as well as the design principles that drive how the solution is developed, let's take a look at a key feature, metric correlations. While viewing the metrics tab, you'll see metric correlations on the upper right-hand corner, which is turned off by default. So what I'll do is turn it on. And once we do that, we'll see a heading at the top that asks us to select a time frame. To select a time frame, what we'll do is use our mouse and left click and drag to highlight a time period. So randomly, I'm just going to drag right here and select a time period. And keep in mind, we need to select at least 15 seconds for this to work. Once we do that, we'll see other charts show the same time period, which helps us find correlations. Once we've selected a time period, we could click the Find Correlations button to see any data that NetData deems is related. For an example of this, after I selected a time period and there's a bit of a CPU spike, we could see that storage had to do with that particular CPU spike. There was some I.O. pressure on the system. My suggestion for you is to have a click around and practice metric correlation, as it's a good idea to practice this when there's not currently an issue happening. So that way, whenever something does happen, you'll have a bit of muscle memory when it comes to correlating metrics. Now right here, I see a spike in resource usage. So what I'll do is turn on metric correlations. And then I'll select a time period that includes the spike I'm curious about. And then again, I'll click find correlations. And as you can see, all the charts are aligned around the same time that particular event happened. So as you can see, I chose a time period. And right here, NetData sees that there's been 21 correlated metrics associated with the region of time that I highlighted. Again, just play around with this and get some practice on your own. And this way, you could correlate metrics whenever you need to understand better what's going on within your infrastructure. Another key concept I want to make sure that you're aware of is the concept of collectors within NetData. Collectors work in the background to provide per second metrics from thousands of data sources. And these use what's called zero touch setup, which means that collectors are pre-installed and start working immediately when NetData starts. So if you're curious about the specifics of why NetData needs little to no configuration in order to work, the reason is due to collectors. Collectors work in the background to gather metrics, and each server will have different collectors active depending on the nature of the server. Think of it this way. It wouldn't make sense to have a database engine collector running on a server that doesn't even have a database engine installed. That would be a waste of resources. So if a particular collector isn't relevant, it's not going to be active. But then again, even if a collector isn't relevant, it's built into NetData in case you need to use it. For that reason, even if a server doesn't have a database engine installed when you first deploy it, if you later install something like MariaDB or another database engine, then NetData will activate that collector as soon as the new service is detected. There are two types of collectors within NetData, internal and external. Internal collectors are those that are built into NetData and are always working. External collectors, on the other hand, are modular and gather relevant metrics specific to the applications and services running on that server. These run as independent processes and communicate with NetData via pipes. Within the documentation page for NetData, we can see a list of common privileges, which gives you a good idea what types of privileges are in use as NetData works. Some of these require permissions from a root context or even a user context. It also goes over file permission and ownership, so that way you can make sure that everything is set up properly. It's rare that you'd ever have to provide privileges manually, since NetData's zero-touch mentality takes care of most of this for you. But as an administrator, you should still have a good idea what functions are running on your server, as well as the required permissions for them to run. That way, you have a general idea what's being monitored and what's required from a permission level for NetData to do what it does. If something causes permissions to ever get out of whack, you could use this as a reference when dealing with NetData's permissions. They shouldn't change, but given that many of us are using automation systems, it's possible for a metric to have non-standard permissions. If that ever happens, this will give you a general idea how things are supposed to be so you can compare and contrast with what's happening on your server. Another aspect of NetData that's helpful to understand is functions. Functions allow you to quickly access specific infrastructure information without even having to use SSH. This helps us troubleshoot because knowledge is power and functions allow us to retrieve information we need quickly that we can then use to troubleshoot a situation we might be running into. To better understand this, let's take a look at the processes function. 
This function gives you a list of all the processes that are running on your server. And the thing is, the information you see here is the same information you can see by running the ps command on any server. By being able to see this information within NetData, then you don't have to open an SSH connection to a server and then run the ps command. You can view that information here within NetData without ever having to leave your browser. So as you can see right here, I have the process table open for one of my servers, and you can see the processes that are running on that server. And this is really helpful because, again, you don't have to reach for a terminal. You can view everything when it comes to the process table right here in NetData. Next, let's talk about common troubleshooting scenarios. This is something I've touched on a few times throughout the series, especially earlier when I mentioned that some anomalies are expected. And one example I gave was that of a server that's used to generate reports, and that server wouldn't normally see a resource spike unless someone was actually running a report. In that example, if a user does run a report, it'll likely cause a resource spike, but considering that the server exists for the purpose of running reports, those kinds of resource spikes are expected. Often, though, anomalies are not expected, and sometimes the extent of an anomaly might not be immediately apparent. For example, suppose you have a server where 50% of its memory is generally utilized at any given moment. Over the course of time, you notice that memory usage increases every day, even though the actual usage of that server itself hasn't increased. In some cases, this might expose what's known as a memory leak. Sometimes a bug in an application can cause something like this, and usually if you restart a service, it'll free up unused memory. Now this could be a one-off situation, or maybe you notice that after a few days, memory usage always increases for no apparent reason. If you do see such a thing, it might be a situation in which you should file a bug report with a vendor for the application that you're running. In the meantime, while you're waiting for the app to get fixed, you may need to restart the service every now and then to keep it running properly. And situations like this represent negative trends. Another example of this is storage that starts to fill up. You might notice that metrics within a graph are regularly increasing. Personally, I've seen this situation come up a lot when dealing with application logs that are constantly being written to such as an error message appearing in logs over and over again, and then the log files start to balloon to a ridiculous size. Another culprit of storage-related issues can be with a mail server, where you notice that the storage volume is getting full. Meanwhile, users are complaining that emails they're sending are not reaching their destination. In that case, you might have a mail server that's stuck and is unable to send mail, so the queue just gets larger and larger and then saturates your available disk space. While using NetData, negative trends like these are definitely something to pay attention to. Sure, you might have plenty of space on a server and it's not showing any alarms, but if you see available storage space getting less and less, then you'll notice the graphs over time steadily increasing. When a metric is increasing regularly with nothing to blame it on, that's a negative trend. But sometimes negative trends aren't anything to do with application issues. For example, consider a storage server where your users are storing important files. In that situation, a regular increase in used storage space is expected and it's a way of life. As people store files, you'll see available space start to decrease. Again, this is normal, but it can help you ascertain when it's a good time to add another disk to a storage array to handle the growth that you're seeing within your company. In that case, you might have a company policy to add new disks to your array anytime used space reaches 80%. This way, you can stay on top of your server and enable it to grow with your users. It's definitely a lot better than waking up in the middle of the night when alarms start going off that the volume is full. Staying on top of resource trends is important. The same can also be true of things like CPU. As your company's website gains popularity, you'll notice that regularly over time, CPU usage increases. Not because there's an actual problem, but rather the natural growth of your company might eventually mean that you'll have to allocate new resources and expand accordingly. The way you detect these trends is simply to view your graphs. You might notice that there's regular elevation in resource usage, and that also helps you predict when you might need to add new storage volumes in order to match the expected growth of the server. By doing a bit of math, you can determine the average amount of storage used every day and then be able to predict the time period in which you'll likely need to add new disks. And this will enable you to order new storage ahead of time and have it ready when your server growth reaches a particular point. It's my recommendation to keep an eye on this, especially if you're in the business of hosting other companies. They'll really appreciate it if you're proactive when it comes to expanding resources. Now, before I close out this video, there's one more concept that I want to let you guys know about, and that is the idea behind war rooms. Over here on the left, you'll see that I have three rooms right here, production, testing, and test war room. 
I created this just playing around with NetData, but basically we can create a new room by clicking the plus icon right here. And before I create it, the concept of a war room is to have a room where all of your servers that are associated with a particular event are visible and all of your stakeholders will have access to it. So what I'll do is create another war room right here. I'll give it a quick description and then I'll click add. And when you first create a room, it's empty. There's no nodes that are associated to this particular room as of right now. Now what we can do, as it says right here, is go to room settings and add some nodes. Up here, we get a command we can use to add a new server to this particular war room. And this is for those of you that don't have NetData already installed on a particular server. But if you scroll down here, you'll see some of the nodes that you have associated with your account. So what I'll do right now is just click a few of these, just choose a few randomly. And then once we've selected the servers that we want to be a part of the room, we could click this plus icon right here to finalize our changes. You'll see that I have three servers that are associated right here, the ones that I've just added. But the idea here is you add all the servers that are experiencing a problem or are related to a bigger issue. And once you have all of the servers added right here, then what you'll do is go over here to the Users tab. You'll click the plus icon right here to invite users to the War Room. And the idea behind this is you'll add stakeholders or anyone that's working on the problem. You'll send them an invite to this particular room, which lets everyone see the same information. Then during a conference call or something like that, you could all see the same information and troubleshoot it together. And when you add somebody to a room, what you do is you just type their email address in right here, whatever it happens to be, and then you give them a role which will determine their permissions within the room. For a stakeholder, for example, you might add observer. They want to observe the situation. Meanwhile, your system administrators, you'll probably give them the admin role. And I'm not going to add this particular email address right here because it's just a fake email address, but you get the idea. You add their email address right here, you choose a role, and then you click send right here to send them an invite. And that will allow them to see the room. And then after that, you and your stakeholders, as well as your system administrators, can troubleshoot an issue together, which is a really great feature. Having everyone able to see the same information will help you troubleshoot that much faster. And there you go. In this video, we explored troubleshooting concepts around NetData, and I hope it helped you out. And like I mentioned a few times during this video, and also during the entire series, troubleshooting is a way of life when it comes to system administration. When something goes wrong, it's important that we're on our toes, we assess the situation, and then we fix it. And I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Be sure to click the like button if you did enjoy this episode. And in the next video, which is actually the final video in the series, we're going to explore one more important concept, and that's the concept of best practices. So as soon as you're ready, I'll meet you over in that episode. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching this episode.